No, I, I'm sorry. I'm about to. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Rachel Conrad. I'm the Chief Communications Officer at Impossible Foods, um, is a food company based in California's Silicon Valley. I just want to say it's a huge honor to go after Fernando Machado. He's truly one of the best CEOs in the business, and I consider him a real mentor. Um, as you know, um, Impossible Whopper is a big hit and it's sold in all uh, 7,500 Burger Kings nationwide. So please try it. It'll help you understand the company. And if that's not enough, I'll give you a little bit more of, a, of an insider's view of Impossible. I've been at the company for about four years and I just wanted to walk you guys through some of what the company has been up to since we, since we launched. Um, so first of all, Impossible Foods is very much a mission-driven company. I think every company says that, but Impossible Foods' goal is truly to make Earth awesome again by transforming the global food system. Our goal is to make a difference on the planet that you can literally see from space. And I'll tell you about how and why we're doing that. Our strategy is to make delicious, nutritious, and sustainable meat, fish, and dairy foods directly from plants bypassing livestock entirely. And the way we're doing that is we're putting our products on the open market so real people can choose for themselves. So the, pro the company started back in 2011. Uh, this is a photo of Pat Brown. He was a very successful Stanford biochemistry professor leading an award-winning laboratory. He was doing cures for cancer and um, helping to decode the human genome. He's the inventor of the DNA microarray. He quit his job back in 2011 to start Impossible Foods because he was concerned that the current system that we use to make uh, meat is not scalable. We've really reached kind of peak, peak ability to produce meat using the really old fashioned method of, of livestock. So he literally built a team that was responsible for reverse engineering at the molecular level, um, how and why meat tastes and performs the way it does, and then um, reverse engineering that to use make the same product that delivers the same amount of deliciousness, nutrition, and um, you know versatility, but without using animals. Um, let me tell you about why that's so important. So humans, as everybody here knows, have, have a very long relationship with meat. Um, we've literally been eating it uh, since about the time we invented fire. Um, when you look at cave drawings in Lascaux, France, um, you know, it's really about our relationship with meat. You know, we were hunters, right? Hunters and gatherers. Um, in the Middle Ages, the second photo picture here, you know, we still had a very one-on-one -on -one relationship with the animals we ate. Um, literally, we just, you know, killed them in our yards or in the castle courtyard um, and consumed them one, one by one. Um, by about the, the 19, you know, 1900 or so, we started to industrialize the process of meat consumption. Um, in, instead of killing our own animals, we started to be able to go to butcher shops. Um, and now we have fully industrialized the process um, you know, to the extent that a lot of people don't even understand where their meat is coming from, how it's made, what the slaughterhouse process looks like, um, you know, and we have done, we have, we have scaled up meat to the maximum possible capacity. We're literally now at a, a point where we're slaughtering 47 pigs per second per day globally. Um, that's actually not sustainable because already um, livestock and their crops consume about 45% of the arable land in the world. We have literally created a planet in which about half of the usable land is dedicated to livestock. Um, and this is land that unfortunately then can no longer be used for native ecosystems, for biodiversity, for native wildlife, native flora and fauna. It also can't be used for photosynthesis um, as, it, as it used to be because we have eliminated a lot of the biodiversity and we've replaced it with 
cows or you know sheep or pigs or chickens or their feed crops. Um, so Pat's idea back in 2011 was what if there was a better way to do this? What if we could make meat delicious, nutritious, uh, versatile, affordable meat that real meat lovers crave, but without the animal? What if we could make it actually sustainable? What if we could reduce the carbon footprint of meat production to such an extent that we could allow a huge percentage of that 45% of the earth that is now dedicated to livestock, we could return that back to native ecosystems? What if we could do that? So the way to do that is obviously you got to make meat even better than the current use of animals as the food production technology. You got to make it just as juicy, delicious, nutritious, but you got to make it better in that you got to make it sustainable, which using livestock for meat is just, is just not. So basically, Pat and his team of, of scientists back in 2001 to 2016 um, started to discover why does meat taste the way it does? Why is it so craveable? Why do we humans literally dream about it, think about it all the time? Why does it occupy such a special place in, in our cultures, in our cuisine, in our world? Um, the reason is actually because of something called heme. Heme is a molecule that is essential to life. Um, heme is already ubiquitous in everything you eat. It's already ubiquitous in you. Um, it's the reason why your cheeks are red, your lips are red. It's the reason why your body can absorb oxygen. If you don't have heme, you literally die pretty quickly. Um, heme is found in massive abundance in mammal muscle. Uh, because it's used to carry oxygen. Um, another word for mammal muscle, by the way, is meat. Um, so while heme is found in everything from, you know, broccoli to um, milk to soybeans, it's found in very, very high concentrations in, in meat. It's really the reason why we and other true carnivores, like, you know, cats, really crave, um, crave meat. So we thought, you know, since heme is available and in everything and it's ubiquitous in the world, why don't we take heme from plant sources, which is, you know, biochemically identical to the heme in um, meat from animals and use that in a reverse engineered um, version of a burger, you know, this iconic American dish, probably America's uh, number one global export, the burger. If we could do that, we could actually reverse engineer meat from the molecular level up and duplicate everything that consumers love about meat from animals without the animal. So we did that. Um, we, we get heme from the uh, soy plant. Um, again, heme is found everywhere. It's in the plant kingdom. Soy actually has quite a bit of heme. Um, this is why when you cut open the roots of, of soy plants, there are pieces of it that are bright red, just like a steak. Um, we also, in our burger, use soy protein, which is grown and milled right here in the U.S. soy belt of Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois. Um, we use potato protein. We use coconut oil. We use um, you know, uh, minerals, um, amino acids, a lot of really good stuff. Um, and we get a product that actually rivals the um, animal analog, which is ground beef from cows um, for taste. Um, we've done a ton of studies, about half the people don't even under, don't, don't, don't realize that they're eating Impossible Burger when they are in a very specific blind taste test that we do. Um, and a, a big proportion um, of, of the people actually prefer our burger to the animal analog. Um, so from a taste perspective, we've nailed it. Um, but significantly from a sustainability perspective, we have delivered a vast improvement over you know, old meat that, that we as humans have been eating since the time of the invention of fire. Our uh, product, the Impossible Burger, uses 96% less land. That should be obvious because we don't have vast tracts of you know, concentrated animal feeding operations or slaughterhouses. Um, we use 87% less water. This is pretty important because the livestock sector is literally, um, you know, the number one user and polluter of water, uh, freshwater worldwide. 
our product also re um, reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 89%. A lot of people worry about what they drive um, as a big uh, factor in determining their personal carbon footprint. But in fact, what you eat is critically important. And it's the easiest thing you can do to change uh, your personal carbon footprint. You know, instead of worrying about, um, you know, getting an electric vehicle, getting solar panels, getting a charging station, you know, you can do that too. And I'm a big fan of that. But actually, there's an easier way. You can actually just have meat made from plants instead of meat made from animals. And that alone is going to dramatically shrink your carbon footprint, that of the country, that of the world. Um, the other great thing about Impossible Burger is that while it delivers all of the taste and, um, it, you know, and versatility of ground meat from animals, um, because our product doesn't start with an animal, it has no cholesterol, it has no animal hormones, it has no antibiotics, uh, significantly, it also has no chance of contributing to the next zoonotic pandemic because it doesn't require livestock. You know, and again, I'm just I just want to mention that the, the, the real important thing here is that we've developed a product that tastes great. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't even be able to to play in this in this realm of um, of plant based meat. We wouldn't call it that. It wouldn't be that. Um, instead, we've developed a product that actually satisfies hardcore meat lovers. Um, about more than nine out of 10 of our customers do eat meat from animals. Um, it this shows that it satisfies them. We're displacing meat from animals in the grocery store aisle. About 72 cents of every dollar spent on Impossible Burger is money that is no longer spent in the in the animal meat aisle. Um, and this is a great thing for for the planet and the environment. Like I said, our goal is to make a difference that you can see from space. Um, if we can take these 45% of the Earth's land that is currently being used for livestock and their crops and turn it back to native ecosystems, let biodiversity flourish, we actually can make Earth awesome again. And uh, it's been a great pleasure talking to everyone here. If you have any questions, I'm always available, um, rachel.conrad at impossiblefoods.com. Always happy to answer your questions, provide sourcing and citations for everything I've said. And um, I look forward to getting to know everyone here um, better in the, in the years to come. Thank you very much.